Good morning. Welcome to this time of worship on this Lord's Day here at the First Church of Christ in Longmeadow in the United Church of Christ. We're very glad that you're here to join us, whether you are joining us online, uh, live stream vers um, via Facebook or YouTube, or whether you're here in our sanctuary, which is such a nice change now that we're back in person. We are all gathered very much together in spirit before God for a time of worship. Please know that we are an open and affirming congregation extending an extravagant welcome to all, as we say in the United Church of Christ, no matter where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Our call to worship this summer is a really short, responsive one from the Psalms. I will say to you, this is the day that the Lord has made, and you respond, all right, Betsy's got it. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is great. I love the enthusiasm. Okay, friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, indeed. And I extend to you now the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you turn and from a distance, if you're in the sanctuary or at home, turn to the person next to you and say, the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Peace of Christ to you. Peace of Christ to you. Peace of Christ to you, Marisa. Peace of Christ to you, Dan. Peace. Please join in our opening prayer. Holy God, we come to you on this beautiful summer morning. We are here to worship you. No other reason. We are filled with joy in who you are and in the opportunity to gather as one in this place. We ask that you would fill this sanctuary, fill the homes of those gathered online with the presence of your spirit, that this will be a time of deep worship and celebration in your very presence. We love you, Lord, and we give you this hour of worship in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, if you are at home, you are invited to stand and sing. If you are here, you may stand and listen to our opening hymn from our soloist, our tenor soloist, Mark Pullman.
You may be seated. Well, this is the time in our service when we usually have our children's message, and it's now a message for all ages because we don't have any young people here in the sanctuary, or I would invite you down front, but I trust there are some young people out there watching, and you all are invited to listen in as well. Anybody here like cookies? Cookies, yeah, cookies are good. So if I, if I were allowed to serve food in the sanctuary, which I'm not, I would have a big jar of cookies with me. And um, I would ask you, has your, um, have you ever come home and asked your mother whether you could have a cookie? Mom, can I have a cookie? Probably that never happens in your house, right? Or, <laughs> yeah, of course you have. And what does your mother say to you? Does your mom always say, sure? Maybe sometimes, but not always, right? Sometimes mom might say, yes, okay, you can have a cookie. I know you just got home from a school and you're probably hungry and it's going to be a while before we have supper. So sure, you can have, you can have two cookies. But sometimes mom might say, I need you to wait. It's almost time for supper. And if you have some cookies now, you'll spoil your appetite. I'd like you to eat a good supper. You're gonna like what we have. And then you can have cookies for dessert. That's not so bad, is it? What if your mother says, no, this might never happen at your house, but does your mother ever say no? Yeah, how does that make you feel? Yeah? We don't really like it when, when we hear the answer no. Wait, maybe we can handle. But sometimes the answer is no. And is it because our moms are so mean or because they're just really bossy and they want to show us, hey, I am in charge, you're not? No, I would have to say no. No, moms love us, right? Nobody loves us like our moms. Moms want the very best for us. And so sometimes mom might say no. Mom might say, you just got home from Robert's birthday party, and I know that you had lots of treats at Robert's birthday party, and if you eat some cookies right now, I know that you're probably going to get sick to your stomach, and you're not going to be a happy person, right? Mom knows what's best. Sometimes mom says, yeah, I, I, want, I want to give you a cookie. I'd love to give you these homemade cookies. Sometimes mom says, I need you to wait. And sometimes mom says, no, that wouldn't be a good idea right now. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because today in our sermon, we're talking about um, prayer. And prayer's talking to God, right? Prayer's like this back and forth. It's coming into God's presence, just like when you come home from school into the house, you're coming into the house of God, or maybe you're just getting quiet in your own house, and you're asking God something, perhaps. And sometimes God says yes. Sometimes when we ask God for something, we get exactly what we ask for. That does happen sometimes. I've noticed in my life, because I'm getting to be a little bit older now, I'm noticing that God doesn't always say yes. Sometimes God says, wait. And I'll notice that after a while, that thing that I thought should have happened just the way I wanted it, just at the time I wanted it, didn't happen quite yet, that some other business had to happen a lot of the time. It's because I needed to learn some things or understand something better. I needed to grow up a little bit before it was time for God to say yes, Dallas, yes to that prayer. But sometimes I've discovered that the answer to a prayer seems to be no. Sometimes no matter how hard I pray for something, I discover that it doesn't necessarily get answered in the way that I want. You know, I might say, Lord, please let Susie still like me and want to be my friend even after that fight we had. And maybe Susie has been hurt and, and isn't so keen to come back and be my friend. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes the answer is no. And when that happens, I always remember that I can trust God even more than my mom. And I trust my mom. Hi, mom. My mom's watching. Um, we trust our moms. We love our moms. They, they want, especially when we're growing up, they know things we don't know sometimes. And God knows some things sometimes that we don't know. God knows everything, right? And so we trust that even when God says, Wait, 
that God knows what's best. And we trust that when God says, no, we have to trust that God knows what's best for us. And you know what? The people in the story this morning are going to discover that sometimes God says yes. And that's cause to celebrate. And so I'd like to, to pause right now and pray with you. Would you please, we don't have to, you can pray any way you want. You can pray standing up or laying on your tummy, but I'm going to ask you to just close your eyes, bow your head, and let's pray. Pray, pray after me. Dear Lord, thank you for always knowing what is best for me. I trust you, Lord. Please help me to trust you more. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, before we turn to our scripture this morning, will you please join me in a prayer for illumination? Let's pray. Holy God, we come into your presence prepared to hear from your holy word. We know that it is unlike any other word, alive and active, sharp as any two-edged sword, and yet also encouraging, filled with your power and your presence. Please speak to us in these next moments. Give us ears to hear and hearts to trust you more as you unfold to us its meaning in the ways and in the time in which you know is best for us. Hear now this prayer and speak now through your word. Amen. I'm going to invite Peter Ludwig to come forward and read our scripture. Today's scripture reading is from Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 17. About that time, King Herod laid violent hands upon some who belonged to the church. He had James, the brother of John, killed with the sword. After he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the festival of the unleavened bread. When he had seized him, he put him in prison and handed him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. While Peter was kept in prison, the church prayed fervently to God for him. The very night before Herod was going to bring him out, Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers while guards in front of the door were keeping watch over the prison. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He tapped Peter on the side and woke him saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his wrists the angel said to him, fasten your belt and put on your sandals. He did so. Then he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Peter went out and followed him. He did not realize that what was happening with the angel was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. After they passed the first and the second guard, they came before the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and walked along a lane when suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. As soon as he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many had gathered and were praying. When he knocked at the outer gate, a, ma a maid named Rhoda came to answer. On recognizing Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the gate, she ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you were out of your mind. <laughs> but she insisted that it was so. They said, it is his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the gate, they saw him and were amazed. He motioned to them with his hand to be silent and described for them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he added, tell this to James and to the believers. He then left and went to another place. Thus ends today's reading.
Once a few years ago, I was invited to a pastor appreciation breakfast. It happened to be at the offices of a a big Christian publisher, lots of pastors there. And the guest speaker was a fellow by the name of Jim Cimbala. That name may not mean anything to you, Um, but Jim is the pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle in Brooklyn, New York. And if you don't know his name, you may know the name of his wife, Carol, who directs the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. And you may have heard of them. They have won some Grammy Awards. They, their, their music of praise to God is just um, phenomenal, award-winning, and well-known. Well, when the symbols were called in 1971 to the, the church there, it wasn't called the Brooklyn Tabernacle at the time. It was a really run-down place. There were about 30 to 40 members there. And we happen to know, all of us pastors, that now that church has about 10,000 members. 10,000! Big theater, huge services, two hour services, by the way. Just saying. Um, and we were excited. We're thinking, oh, pastors, we're going to hear from Jim Cimbala. What's he going to tell us? Maybe he's going to give us some great advice on how to grow a church, some tips on, you know, programs or, or um, the latest strategies or maybe some really awesome marketing campaigns. We didn't know what he was going to share with us, but we thought it was just going to be something that was good and something that was encouraging. The refrain from Jim's, Jim Cimbala's message was really very simple. He kept saying again and again, be with God. Be with God. Just be with God. Cimbala said, said that before um, God can use you, before um, God can do meaningful work in and through you in any way, You have to be with God. You have to know God. Be with God often. Otherwise, he said, you know, you can do church. You can do the church thing. You can gather. You can have meetings. You might even enjoy some wonderful music together. But it will be empty of God's spirit in the way that worship is meant to be. Worship is meant to have God's spirit to be filled. And you can't just go through the motions if you want to truly have worship. And you know, that might seem obvious in some ways, but I'm not so sure that it always is because sometimes it's easy to get distracted, right? We get distracted with the business of the church, right, Maura? We have meetings, we have lots of meetings, and there is important business to do. We care for this building. We plan our worship services. We have staff who do the work of the church. There's lots going on here. There's ministry, there's outreach, a lot, and it's important. But Jim Cimbala, This pastor who grew this church, well, he'll be the first to say that God grew the church. He says, be with God. And as we uh, are getting ready to wind down our series in the book of Acts, in which we've been asking, what does it really mean to be the church? I want to to borrow that refrain from Jim Cimbala and to say, to really be the church is to be with God, and often. You know, what makes the church unique, after all, from from, um, any social clubs or other mission organizations or social service agencies, all of which, by the way, are very, very good things. But what is it that makes the church different from these? I would suggest that it is God. It is God, because without God, the church cannot be the church. It will cease to be the church if God ceases to be the focus of who we are and why we do what we do. So, to be the church is to be with God, and at the heart of the church is God made known to us in Jesus Christ to open the door for all of us to go directly into the presence of God, to be with God, live and in person, as it were, at any time and in any place. And that, of course, is what we call prayer, which sometimes seems like such an inadequate word to me. It means be with God. So, This morning's text. The church is gathered at a member's home to pray for a very specific need. They have been there for hours praying 
pleading with God for Peter's release from prison. And you need to remember that this is the time of the early church, not long after Pentecost. And so these people, they've seen a lot of miraculous stuff. And in fact, the disciples, the 12 who were with Jesus, now called apostles, they're actually doing some stuff that only Jesus did, you know, when Jesus was walking on the earth. So this is a time of miracles. And in the past, usually in the early past, it seemed like whenever somebody was in prison, and they were, by the way, they were jailed, um, they prayed and the person was released from prison. And then there came a time of persecution. And we've talked about that. And the church begins to spread from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth, just like Jesus said that it would. And last week we saw that even the Gentiles were included in God's kingdom. They received the Holy Spirit, just like the eight Jewish believers on Pentecost. But with this increased persecution, they've been discovering that their prayers are not always answered in the way they want. The Apostle James, for example, had recently been imprisoned and then killed, even though they had prayed for James's release. Because they're learning that God does not always protect believers from painful experiences, even when they've been praying earnestly and often. And you guys probably know that, right? I don't need to tell you. You've all lived for a while on planet Earth. You've all experienced this. A loved one dies. Someone's fired from a job. A relationship's in deep trouble. Racists burn down your church building. A pandemic turns the world upside down. Now, sometimes when we pray, we get exactly what we've asked for with a resounding yes, and we do celebrate that. And sometimes the response, as I said earlier, is some version of no. And sometimes the answer is simply wait. But please remember that no matter what the answer, to pray is to intentionally carry yourself into the presence of God. Our common gesture, remember I asked the kids to bow your head. That is, that is a, um, a sign of submission and a sign of trust. And so as followers of Jesus Christ, we follow the lead of Jesus himself, who was always slipping away to have some time to talk to God the Father. We follow the lead of the early church that poured itself out in prayer. It's pounding at heaven's door for Peter's release. So let's take a closer look at Peter now. This is not Peter's first time in prison. It's not even his second time in prison. It's actually his third time. And I don't think we had this text, but the second time Peter is released from prison miraculously, um, he actually goes back to the authorities who had imprisoned him in the first place to do a little bit more preaching, you know, at them, to them. That's what he was in prison for the first time. And, and these guys, the leaders, they're stunned because they think Peter's in jail. And yet he stands there right in front of them saying that, you know, his life has become a witness to the sovereign God. And he's not afraid for that reason. He trusts God. And that becomes really evident in this account that, that this Peter, this Peter <laughs> just read for us a few minutes ago. Peter is sleeping in jail. I don't care if you've been there before. He's sleeping in jail, and he's bound in chains. There's a guard sleeping on each side of him. There are two more guards that are posted at the door. This is actually a quadrupling of what would have been the normal process and procedure. So Peter's like a high risk. He's a high flight risk. And the angel of the Lord suddenly appears in the cell. And I love the fact that the angel doesn't initially wake up Peter which you think that the presence of the glory of God would awaken you, right? But um, I think it's really funny that Peter's sleeping so peacefully that he has to sort of nudge him a couple times and say, hey, hey, wake up, wake up. <laughs> and um, this is clearly a man, Peter, who's not anxious about his life. This is a man who is in jail and sleeping like a baby because he has learned to trust God. Now, remember, Peter's one of the apostles who walked with Jesus for three years. Remember also about Peter. This is the guy 
the impetuous guy who was always putting his foot in his mouth. He had that foot and mouth disease. He's the guy who cut off the servant's ear in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's the guy who betrayed Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. There's the magic number of three again. So he's been the hard route. He's walked through the good times and the bad times with God, and so he has learned to trust God. Now, when this very non-anxious Peter finally wakes up, he follows the angel out of the jail, the very first thing Peter does is go to the house where the church presumably had met on a regular basis, and they are there praying for Peter's release. And Peter walks up to the front gate of the house, and he bangs on the door, and he's interrupting the prayer meeting. And so they send the maid, Rhoda. And she goes to answer the door, and she opens the door, and she's, she's, she actually recognizes Peter's voice on the other side. And she's just so shocked that it's Peter that she runs back to the people who are praying and says, Peter's at the door. You can stop. You know, your prayer's been answered. And what's really funny is that she doesn't even open the door. She leaves Peter standing outside, which I think is hilarious. But um, the people inside, as we heard, they say, you have lost your mind. You're crazy. Isn't that what the di disciples said to the women who came back from the tomb as well? It's hard to believe miracles. We ask, we plead, we pray for, for a miracle, and then when it happens, why do we have trouble believing it sometimes? But they do. And the servant girl says, you know, you can stop praying. He's right there at the door. And they say, no way. And she says, yes way. And it always begs the question to me, like, why doesn't somebody just go and open the door and see whether Peter's actually there? But we know that he is there. And it, it, it makes me wonder, what was the church thinking when they were praying for Peter on this third arrest? You know, in this time of persecution, had they maybe in fact learned to sort of lower their expectations in prayer? Were they maybe just saying, well, Lord, could you please just make Peter comfortable in jail? Give him courage as he faces this hour of death? Or did the church actually continue to say, Lord, please free Peter from jail? You know, when a church member's loved one, a loved one gets sick, we pastor types are sometimes asked things like, how should I pray? Should I be praying for healing? What if he dies? <laughs> what would that say about my prayers? What would that say about God? So it's as if, it's almost as if we too, as the pastors, are tempted to sort of lower our expectations in prayer. One writer put it this way. Um, he says, we are tempted to make sure that we keep God off the hook in case we do not receive what we want. But, he writes, there is no such thing as playing it safe in prayer. It cannot be done because when you pray, heaven and earth come together. Let me say that again. When you pray, heaven and earth come together. How can you possibly do that safely? How can you stand in the presence of God and have any illusions of being safe? Prayer is never safe. End of quote. I think probably the most important things that Jesus said to all of us were, you know, ask, seek, knock. You don't have because you don't ask. Pray, pray, pray. He never said to pray for the ability not to care about what happens as a result. Prayer is, in fact, when we lift our greatest questions, our greatest needs, right up into the presence of God. And in, in 1 John 5, we're told if we ask anything according to God's will, he hears us. The imperative words being, if we ask it according to God's will, but you know, then how can you even know the will of God if you haven't been in the presence of God? Hmm. You have to be in the presence of God to hear God, to discern God. And that raises the question for the first church of Christ in Longmeadow, how can we really know the, the will of God for us? How can we really know God's vision for us if we are not in the presence of God and asking God? People have a lot of really big questions about prayer, even in the church. Sometimes I find especially in the church, they ask them quietly in the pastor's office, they don't want to admit maybe in, in, in 
in front of other people that, that maybe they're having doubts about prayer. A lot of people have those kinds of questions, and I think what we really want to know is, does prayer work? Does it mean, if I say I want a burger with lettuce, tomato, onions, and no pickle, I'm going to get a burger with lettuce, tomato, and no pickle when I want it, because that's the way we're trained, right? Have it your way. I know I'm old because that's an old jingle. I don't know the new ones anymore. But we're, we're trained to get what we want when we want it, and to be specific and say what you want. And that's not a bad thing when you're ordering a hamburger. But... Prayer is more tricky than that. You know, I wish I could say, every time we pray the impossible, God's going to accomplish the impossible if we just pray hard enough. We're going to get it the way that we want. But we know that reality is much more complicated than that. And even during this remarkable time of miracles in the early church, when remarkable things are happening and the Holy Spirit is just blowing, breezing through places in ways that we haven't seen for a long time, um, the church understood that Peter might still die by the sword the next morning. They believed God, but they'd seen their friend Stephen stoned to death, and they'd just recently lost their brother and friend James, who was the brother of John, one of the 12 apostles. How often have we prayed for the impossible, trusting God's ability only to mourn our disappointment? So does prayer work in the sense that God always responds with what we want when we want it the way we want it? You know, it's no. The answer is no. Not, not always. Not in the way we want it, not when we want it. Sometimes God says no or wait. But if you want to know, does prayer work in the sense that does prayer change things? The answer is a resounding yes. The answer is a resounding yes. Prayer changes things. And, and, and uh, you know, as many before me have, um, have said, what it really changes most is the person who's doing the praying. Because in prayer, you actually intentionally stand in the presence of God. You pause from all the other stuff that you're doing from your meetings, and you stop and you pray and you stand in God's presence. And how can you stand in God's presence and not experience change in your life? One of the greatest changes is that you start to tune in to God, to God's will, to what God is saying, to be able to understand what the heck is going on here, that there's something much bigger than what I'm focused on when I order my burger. And you need to, to understand that because then you need to be able to rest in it because when God says no cookies because you were at a birthday party and you'll get sick, that sounds like a trivial example, and maybe it is, but the whole point is that do you trust God? I prayed in our prayer with the kids, Lord, I trust you. Please help me to trust you more. That's a prayer that a Roman actually said to Jesus. Lord, I trust you. Help me to trust you more. I have faith, I believe, but, but it's hard. Help me to trust you and believe even more. What I want to encourage you to do is to pray because that's what Jesus did and that's what Jesus said to do and pray boldly because sometimes God says yes. God wants to hear from us. It's not just a matter of, of you know, standing in front of God. It's a communion with God. Bring your requests. You don't have to temper them. Bring your godly requests, the healing of a friend, the restoration of a failing marriage. Um, maybe, you know, we were tempted to protect ourselves from disappointment um, or to kind of pray responsibly or avoid presuming on God. And God says no. Pray boldly. Pray for what is good. Pray God's sovereignty and, and trust God. And friends, that only comes with time and that only comes with practice of being in God's presence regularly and watching how God responds, even when God says wait, even when God says no. And when you pay attention, and keeping the journal is a really good idea. You start writing down the answers and when they come and how they come, you're going to start noticing that 
kind of like the mom in my illustration. I keep pointing up there, there's the camera where my mom is. Um, kind of in that illustration, it's like God knows what's going on in the world. God has the big picture, God knows what we need. And sometimes God says no, and sometimes God says wait, and sometimes God says yes. So always, always ask, always. God may not choose to alter your circumstances, but the sheer act of standing in the presence of God will encourage you, it will stretch you, and it will change you, and it will help you to grow in your trust of God. Because prayer changes things. Be with God. What does it really mean to be the church, friends? It means to be Firstly and foremost, with God. How can we do anything else if we haven't been with God first? And that shouldn't be hard because we understand. We tell our kids from the time they're in the nursery, right? God loves you. Jesus loves you. This I know. God does love you. God loves you so much that, that God came as a person and gave his life to be the price for all of our bad stuff so that we could have a life lived to the fullest. Be with God. How can you know what our vision is for this church unless we're with God? And friends, we live in a world that is starving with really hard, really fundamental questions. And we don't necessarily have the answer to all of those questions. Questions like, where where have I come from? Where am I heading? Who am I? Why am I here? What's the point of life? Is there any real meaning and purpose to life? What meaning does my life have after the inevitability of death? We don't necessarily have those answers, but we know the one who does. Be with God. Encourage other people to be with God. Those are the questions only God can answer. We live in a really rich country. We don't always feel that, right? But we do. And yet we're asking those same fundamental questions. That's what the church has to offer that no other club or organization has to say, there is somebody, there is purpose, there is reason, there is God. Be with God. Freddie Mercury, you probably know that name. He was lead singer of a wildly successful rock group called Queen. Yes, Queen. And they had so many great hits, didn't they, Betsy? They had great hits. And um, yeah, here's what he said not that long before he died, and he died relatively young. Um, He said, you can have everything in the world and still be the loneliest man in the world. There's only one relationship that's totally loving and goes on forever. What are the answers to life? I don't know, but I know the one who knows. That's what it means to be the church, to be with God, to be in relationship with God. So friends, let's be with God. Let's be with God. Um, Is it hard? Yeah, let me just say, because it's always the preacher standing up here saying, yeah, you need to pray more, right? We know that. Everybody knows that. But it's hard, isn't it? But if you say, I am going to set aside time to do this, I like to light candles because you have to leave, you can't leave them unattended, so you can't wander off and do something else. I don't know about you, but when I sit down to pray, and I do, part of my job, I don't know if you know this, but the, the job description of an ordained minister of word and sacrament is to pray for the people. Did you know that? It doesn't get the big press because you have a lot of committee meetings to do, right, Maura? Uh, (laughs) And you have a lot of responsibilities, but it's to pray for the people and bring God's word to the people. And when I sit down to pray, I could promise you that one of the first things that always happens is I get distracted. I think of something else, and I'm like, I better put that on my list or I'll forget it, because I will. Ask anybody who knows me, I will forget it. Um, You know, or I want to do something, especially if my prayer request is really urgent. It's awfully hard to do, but... It's so worth it. We're talking about entering into the presence of God. The presence of God. Be with God. To pray is to do something. To be intentionally with God. Stop what you're doing. Pay attention to your breathing. Maybe close your eyes. I like to do that so I'm not distracted by what I should be doing. Making my bed and enter in the presence of God. Say like the boy Samuel said, here I am, Lord. Speak, 
Speak, God, your servant is listening. I'm here, I'm listening. Lift your earnest questions and your desperate needs to God, the God of the universe who loves you so tenderly. Be with God, be in the presence of God. Sometimes the answer to prayer is gonna be yes. Sometimes the answer to prayer is gonna be, yeah, I wanna give you the desires of your heart. You know a really good prayer to pray? is um, I always, I've often asked God, somebody told me this when I was in seminary, make the desires of my heart, make them, Lord, the things that you want for me, because then we're not going to be fighting about stuff. That's actually a really good prayer to pray. But sometimes God is delighted to say, yes, yes, Dallas, it is my joy, yes. Sometimes it's not going to be yes. Sometimes it's no. Like on the dark night in Gethsemane, when Jesus prayed, let this cup pass me by. But at all times through prayer, we learn that the greatest miracle is not necessarily the one that you are asking for, but as one pastor said so eloquently, quote, it's the miracle that God is not done creating your life. End of quote. So be with God. And be with God often. May it be so. Amen. This 
is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no human plan can ever pluck me from his hand. I stand on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ, I stand. As we gather in this time of continued prayer, maybe you are reverberating as I am with the power of Mark's sung words. What a powerful expression <clears throat> of being in the presence of God. Thank you, Mark. So as we come to this next time of prayer, we'll be hearing the prayers of the people lifted this morning, and so that's both online and also who are here in person. As we offer prayers, please use first names only because it is a public forum. We are online, and we know that God knows who we are praying for and what they need. So a first name is good. And you may also want to lift an issue of the world you care about or a place you are praying for. So for those who are here in person with me, please, if you want to offer up a prayer out loud, will you lift your hand and I'll call on you, and then I'll repeat what you say so everyone can hear. And those who are online, please, if you'll continue to put in the comments section on Facebook and YouTube your prayer, we will attempt to capture that and share it with our group, both online and in person. Pastor Dallas will help me with that, and so will Brooke. And so we invite you now to put forward your prayers, believing that God hears us, that it matters that we speak. Who has a prayer this morning? I see Anne. Please, Anne. Anne is asking us to pray for the people of Haiti in the wake of the assassination of their president, yes, and the terrible state of unrest of their country. Let us hold them so very much in prayer. What other prayers do we have before God this morning? Mm -hmm. So Betsy is lifting up the people who we continue to hear about deaths from the uh, crumbling of that condominium that, that fell in Florida. We continue to lift up the people who have died and their families and loved ones and all who are so tragically harmed by that event. Yeah. Are there other prayers to be named out loud? Please, Marilyn. Marilyn's lifting up a friend who's recovering from surgery. Thank you. Are there others? Pastor Dallas, do you have some to share with us? I do. Um, sorry. It's okay. Um, pray for uh, Peter and Marie. Comes from Mike. Um, and Iva says to please keep her sister Violet in our prayers that her husband passed away on Friday night. Oh. We've been praying for him last week, as you'll recall. And I don't know if Brooke can see any others. Um, yep. Brooke lifts up an additional prayer from uh, other members, us, the Steger family, actually, praying for Haiti also. So many places in the world. But this place, of course, a place where we have a mission partnership and have for so many years. Um, 
We especially hold the people of Peyti in prayer. Anything else? Okay. Prayers for mom from Michael. Prayers for mom from Michael. Did you have a prayer? Thank you. Dan is lifting up his sister, Emmeline, and asking for prayers for her this morning. Hmm? Anyone else? Okay. So let us hold all these prayers that have been spoken. Oh, I have one more. Prayers for mom from Mike. We ask prayers for mom. So let us come together before our God, holding all of the prayers that have been lifted out loud and the ones that may still remain quiet in our hearts, maybe some that we haven't even identified, needs that we know we have. Oh God, please surround all these prayers. Help us to truly be in your presence, to be bold in asking for what we need and hope for and not to be afraid that you may answer in a way that we don't expect. Help us to grow in our relationship with you by putting ourselves before you with our whole being increasingly and being a witness of this intimate power, not only in our church community but in the whole world that so badly needs your healing love. And so we know and we trust that you are with us this morning. Won't you say with me now the words that Jesus gave us in every time and place, the Lord's Prayer in the words that are most comfortable for you, and let us say it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We turn now to the time of offering. And we are doing it today as we have been now in two ways. We are doing offering both on our live stream on Facebook and YouTube. The ways to give are electronically in your comments. But also in person, we are not yet having ushers come among us with baskets. Instead, we ask that you hold your offering for the end of the worship, and as you file out the Long Meadow Street doors, there will be baskets there. We invite you to please place your offering in the basket. But we want to pray and praise and lift up to our God those things we are giving back out to the world, whether they be our time, our talent, our treasure, whatever kind of prayer they are. So we ask you, God, we are lifting them before you. Make them bigger than us, because alone we can do nothing but with you. Everything is possible. Let us raise our voices as we hold up our offerings to God through the doxology. Almighty God, we know that you hear our prayers. And if we don't yet know that, we ask you to strengthen our faith, that we may be like Peter and trust in you that we are heard. So may our prayers be surrounded. May our offerings this day go out into the world to be the needs 
met for all the people, all the world, all the earth, all the cosmos that needs your healing love. May it go out, surrounded by you, that it may be so. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now I just have a few announcements of our church life together. We continue with our in-person worship in phase two, so please continue to register ahead through either calling our church office and speaking to Jill or on our website or the link in our e-blast each week or on our Facebook page. We will continue to live stream on Facebook and YouTube so that you can be with us from home if that feels right or else you can join us here in person. We look forward to having you with us however you come. Church programming for our children in July has our summer hours, so the second and fourth Sundays. We do church school on the second Sunday, which is today, and the fourth Sunday will be family worship on Zoom. Both start at noon. So today we have church school starting at 12 on Zoom, 12 to 12.30, grades K through 2 with Miss Elaine, and 12.30 to 1 p.m. with Miss Carolyn, both on the church Zoom today. In terms of our youth programming, our youth leader Kaylee is offering events each week this summer, pick up basketball, music jams, art nights, youth group, book club, and mission projects. For middle and high school youth today, please join her at 5 p.m. for arts night here at First Church. It'll be out on the front steps in the green in front of church on Long Meadow Street. That's 5 p.m. today. Please meet Kaylee in person for art night. And today, after worship, the Friday evening fellowship group is headed to Tanglewood for potluck picnic lunch on the lawn and for the concert today. You can still join them and buy your tickets. Uh, they are going to meet at the Lions Gate. Picnic starts about 12.30 and the concert at 2.30. And I will be hosting a summer series on the Psalms called Psalms for Re-Emerging a hybrid gathering on the second Wednesdays of the month, July 14th, so that starts this week on Wednesday, August 11th and September 8th, all at 7 p.m., both in person and through Zoom. So you can come and be together in this study, however feels right to you. We'll be in the air-conditioned Buxton room uh, and also on Zoom. So we'll be using the Psalms with reflection together to embody what this last year and a half has been like for us and who we are now. So please think about joining me this Wednesday, July 14th at 7 p.m. in person or on Zoom. Psalms for re-emerging. So for any of our programs or classes, please call the church office for more information, uh, or you can email us at office at firstchurchlongmeadow.org. And as we get ready to end our worship this morning and to leave our sanctuary, I just want to remind you that we are still exiting with special care led by our deacons and ushers. And that means that we'll be starting in the back of the church first and the deacons will move through the pews to let you know it's your turn to leave from the back to the front. This side will leave to your left, go out the middle aisle. This side will leave to your left and go out the side aisle and we'll all go out. And then we have time to connect out on the lawn in front of the church. We are not yet resuming coffee hour, but we know that we want to connect with each other. So we look forward to seeing you after our service. Now we will listen to our closing hymn sung powerfully by Mark Todd. We cannot yet sing out loud together, but let us rejoice in the hearing of live sung music. So please rise in body or spirit as you are able.
Please know that this coming week I will be on vacation and Pastor Marisa will be leading you in worship next Sunday. Um, but I do charge you before I go to be with God, be in prayer. I will be, even from a distance, I will be in prayer for you. Receive now the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance and give to you and to all those whom you love God's peace. Amen. Go in peace.